Hello, my name is Ian Burrell and I'm going to talk about measuring solid fat content. Solid fat content is what the name implies. It's the percentage of solid in a sample of lipids at a given temperature. Why do we care? Because we use that information to improve the quality of products that we all know and love, like chocolate and bacon or peanut butter. One of the methods of measuring this, which is a bit older, is the dilatometer. We take a chilled sample and slowly warm it inside a column. Because solid fat is in a crystalline, highly ordered form, it's a lot more compact. And when it melts and takes on an amorphous form, it grows in volume. That change in volume is what we measure. A second method is time domain nuclear magnetic resonance, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the presentation. It relies on the magnetic moments of subatomic particles inducing a current in the surrounding coil. It sounds complicated, it's actually quite simple, and a lot simpler than a diatomer in my opinion. So how it works? Well, uh, protons, or hydrogen, act like a bar magnet. So it spins on itself, and when placed inside a magnetic field, it will line up with that direction of the field. We'll call that direction B0. We then hit it with the rate of frequency pulse to tilt it in another direction. And then we let it come back. And the time it takes to come back is what we measure. And if you remember Faraday's second law, or uh, the principle of induction, a moving magnetic field will make a change in voltage. On a closed current, that on a closed circuit will induce a current, and that's the current that we measure, that's our signal. Because it's allowed to naturally decay as a signal, we call it free induction decay when it comes to NMR. Now, time versus environment. The more tightly closer at least the atoms are to one another, or the magnets are to one another, the stronger the force. And that's very evident by the equation, because R is a distance between the two magnets or the two atoms. The closer they are, or the smaller that number, the larger the force. And because it's R squared, it actually goes up very significantly. So we can easily distinguish between solids and liquids by the speed at which they come back, being pulled on harder or less hard by the surrounding environment. So if you look at a signal for a second, we can see at the very beginning times there we have the whole thing, the total, the solids and the liquids. You can't measure gas, so it's the total. And over here, at about 70 milliseconds, you have only the liquids. Um, so we're uncertain if it's exactly 70, sometimes it's 65, sometimes it's 75, so we add a correction factor and simply multiply that number by a constant. We also have to add a correction factor at the beginning because we can't measure the first 9 to 11 milliseconds. That's because when you hit your atom with the radio frequency pulse, it gets stunned and kind of shakes around and resonates for a bit. So we start at about 11 milliseconds. To compensate for that, we're going to add a quick correction factor on the solids only, not the total. So without those two issues, solid fat content would be as simple as the total minus the liquids, so the solids, divided by the total to make it a percentage. So if we look at the correction factor, we want to replace as zero the total, we just add liquids to solids. Solids would be total minus the liquids, and there's your correction factor. Um, and then we also said there's a correction factor on F70, what we measure at 7 milliseconds for the liquids. So wherever you see S70, you add a K. And there it is. Now everyone can understand the signal and even work with it. It's very intuitive and straightforward. Finally, some companies give you a digital offset. That is a constant that you add to the denominator right there. It uh, depends on the equipment and the program you use and the computer and so on. To find F and K, you simply measure a sample with a known amount of solid. Usually that's mineral oil with a piece of plastic with known concentrations. And then you find that being every day through a calibration. So how does this compare to dilatometry? Well, since I start speaking with a dilatometer, we may not have measured a single sample yet, depending on the equipment. However, with time domain nuclear magnetic resonance, right now we would have measured our 47th sample. And we would have done so to 1 100th of a percent. Special thanks to Dr. and Gaddy, the primary reviewers, the secondary reviewers, and the audience. If you have my references, are there any questions?